Um, many of you were here last week and may remember somewhat about the topic that I had. All of you that were here probably remember that I missed a slide, even if you don't remember what the topic was. So I'll remind you. All right, so last week, well, maybe. Last week, our topic was Jesus the Christ. And I started that talk with 1 John, a passage in 1 John, and we learned that those who believe that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And those that don't believe that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh, John says is are believing the spirit of the Antichrist. He also tells us that that spirit of Antichrist was already working and was in the world while he was writing that. Romans further told us that God was enduring with great patience the objects that were made for wrath, prepared for destruction, and that the reason for his patience was to make time for those objects of mercy. Those that believed Jesus had come in the flesh. Those that had taken that stone that God sent as a chief cornerstone instead of a rock of offense and a stumbling block. Deuteronomy we went to and it told us that God was going to raise up a prophet from among the people, from among them and he would be a brother of theirs. We, we talked about how Jesus was this man and that he came in the flesh according to the plan of God. We're going to talk a little bit more about that today. Well, we're going to talk a lot bit more about that today. Further, we read in Peter and Romans and Hosea about how God would bring into his household a people which were not a people. Those peoples are the Gentiles or people that are not necessarily of the Jewish people. They're the people that we come from. They're the people outside of the nation of Israel. Today we're going to learn a bit more about the importance of Jesus being a man sent, tempted, tried, and crucified, and how that should impact us. We will see more about the explanation of what John said about those that believe that Jesus has come in the flesh and what that means. So the first slide here. Who here does not recognize this picture? Good. Everybody recognizes it. This picture is an artist's depiction of the Last Supper. How important was it to these disciples that Jesus was a brother of theirs? How important was it in Jesus' message to his disciples that they were his brothers? In Galatians chapter 3, we're going to read from 23 to 29, and then we're going to pick up some verses in the next chapter. But before faith came, we were kept in custody under the law, being confined for that faith that was destined to be revealed. Therefore, the law has become our guardian to lead us to Christ, so that we may be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. For you are all sons and daughters of God through faith, in Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then are you Abraham's descendants, heirs according to promise. 
So there's a lot in these few verses. Uh, what I want to point out here is that this is the process that God used to bring in the people that were not a people. Like he told us in Hosea 2. This is the process that God had planned for the vessels that were destined for mercy. This is why he's holding off, why he's patient on the vessels that are created for destruction. This process of adoption through baptism of the Gentiles. And it says here that we are going to become the household of God. We talked this morning in the adult class about how God planned all of that and everything else in this creation for the express purpose that he would have sons and daughters that loved him. This process is how we become sons and daughters. And directly after this, we have Galatians 4. Verses 1 through 7. Now I say, as long as the heir is a child, he does not differ at all from a slave, although he is owner of everything. But he is under guardians and managers until the date set by the father. So we too, when we were children, were held in bondage under the elementary principles of the world. But when the fullness of time came, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law. How does this tie in with Jesus is come in the flesh? And that's a necessary belief. Jesus come in the flesh, born of a woman, born under the law. Deuteronomy told us that he would be a man. He would be from their brothers. So that he might redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons and daughters. Because you are sons. God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. Therefore you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. Next passage I'd like to turn to is 1 Corinthians 15, verses 20 through 22. But the fact is, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who were asleep. For since by a man came death, by a man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ will all be made alive. So how important is it to understand that Jesus was a man here? How imperative is it that we believe Jesus was a man? First Timothy 2, one, starting at verse 1. Apparently I didn't put all the verses in there. First of all, then, I urge that requests, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made in behalf of all people, for kings and all who are in authority, so that we may, we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. This is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who wants all people to be saved and, come, and to come to the knowledge of the truth, for there is one God and one mediator also between God and mankind, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, the testimony given at the proper time. Again, we have some reinforcement here. We've got three categorizations. We have God, we have mankind, and we have a mediator. How important is that idea of a mediator? What's a mediator for? 
What's their purpose? Would we want a mediator or would we have any faith or anything in common with a mediator who is not at all common to us as a man? What sort of correlation would there be if the mediator representing us was not like us, was not one of us, was not an example that we could ever attain to? And yet what we are told here is that there are three different categories. There's God, there's mankind, and then there's the mediator who was set up between us, the man, Christ Jesus. Some other ideas here. Numbers, chapter 23, verses 9, verse 19. God is not a man that he would lie, nor a son of man that he would change his mind. Has he said, and will he not do it? Or has he spoken, and will he not make it good? So the contrast here, Jesus is a man. In the book of Matthew, he's referred to as son of man almost exclusively. And yet we're told here that God is not a man, and he is not the son of man. Continuing on here, in Acts chapter 2, verses 22 through 24, men of Israel, listen to these words, Jesus the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs, which God performed through him in your midst, just as you yourselves know. This man delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. But God raised him from the dead, putting an end to the agony of death, since it was impossible for him to be held in its power. So this message that is early on, in uh, the apostles' ministry after Jesus ascends to heaven. Think about how important it was for the church to lead off with doctrinal truths. How important was it for them to explain the teachings that we're going to be perpetually rolled forward to our day and hopefully to our children and grandchildren's day to be foundational truths. I'd say it's of utmost importance. When you read a book about foundations or if you look into foundational teachings of any field of study, they start with the basics. And the basics here are Jesus the Nazarene identified the human being and then reinforces it with a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs which God performed through him. In your midst, or in the middle of all of you, all of you saw this, just as you yourselves know. How clear is that message? There's no ambiguity in that message. There's no outside source that has to be created to explain what Jesus is. It's concise and it's complete. God performed the miracles through him, the man. And this was all delivered and predetermined by the foreknowledge of God. Does this tie into Deuteronomy where it says, I'm going to raise up a prophet from among you. He will be from among your brothers. To him you shall listen. 
God's predetermined plan and God's foreknowledge are what created this entire plan of God. And John told us that it is imperative, it is of utmost importance that we believe that Jesus came in the flesh. And Peter here tells us that this man is that Jesus who came in the flesh according to God's predestined plan and predetermined foreknowledge. What's Paul say about this? Hebrews 2, verses 10 through 18. In bringing many sons and daughters to glory, it was fitting that God, for whom and through whom everything exists, should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through what he suffered. Both the one who makes people holy and those who are made holy are of the same family. So Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters. This morning in the adult class, Ben brought up a passage in Peter saying, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil as a roaring lion walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. And then it continues on and it says that we should be emboldened and we should take comfort in the fact that all of our brothers all around this planet suffer the same things we suffer, are tempted by the same things we're tempted by. And they're fighting to do what's right. They're fighting to repent. They're fighting to love God with all their heart, body, and mind. And we are to take comfort in that fact that all of mankind, all of our brothers in the world, under every nation, and under every family that are trying to do God's will are suffering the same things and are carrying their burdens. And Paul here tells us that Jesus is not ashamed to call us his brothers and sisters. And that he will make his people he will make the people holy and make of uh, and make us of the same family. He says, I will declare your name to my brothers and sisters, speaking of God's name. In the assembly, I will sing your praises. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, he says, here am I and the children God has given me. In as much then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death. That is the devil. So think about what we just talked about, the mediator. How important it is, is it that the mediator that we have with God suffered the same things and came from the same background, was of the same family, of the same flesh and blood that we are. That he was tempted, that he was tried, and that he was killed. And we experience those same temptations. We experience those same sufferings. We have a bond between Jesus and ourselves in our humanity. And release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. For indeed, he does not give aid to angels, but he does give aid to the seed of Abraham. Therefore, in all things, he had to be made like his brethren. Okay. He had to come in the flesh. The promised one had to be a man. He had to be human. He had to be relatable. All things, he had to be made like his brethren. What's that leave out? If in every way, in all things, Jesus is just like us, what's that leave out? The explanation is concise here as well. That he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself has suffered, being tempted, he is able to aid those who are tempted. 
So the temptation of Jesus wasn't just a charade that was gone through to check a box on God's prophecy requirement. The temptation of Jesus was a real temptation, one that he could have failed at, one that he had a choice. And Satan knew that. Why do you think Satan tempted him? If Satan could have tripped up Jesus, then it would have ruined God's whole plan. He could have thwarted the entire creation. And Paul tells us here that because Jesus was tempted, he's able to aid those who are tempted. He experienced the same things that we experience. He's our brother. Further in Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 through 16. We just read about how Jesus' temptation in his life here and him being a man gave him the experience and gave him the credentials to be a, an adequate high priest for us. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let's hold firmly to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things, just as we are, yet without sin. Therefore, let's approach the throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help at the time of our need. Yeah, there's a picture of what the mediator does. There's a picture of how that process works. Jesus has experienced it all. He will proclaim our name in front of God. He will say, yes, these are my brothers. This is, these are the people that my blood was spilt for. I know what they're going through because I went through it. I know how hard temptation is because I'm able to be tempted. I was tempted. And Paul takes that as a bolstering of confidence when we go and ask to receive mercy and find grace. Well, what, what process is that? Isn't that when we pray and ask for forgiveness? Isn't that in our lifestyle when we try to be good examples? Isn't that in our day-to-day -day walk when we are trying to be the people that God wants us to be? When we're trying to be Christ-like, our perfect human example? In James chapter 1, we've, we've been talking here about Jesus and his ability to be tempted. So another kind of tangent thought here. James chapter 1, verses 12 through 15. Blessed is a man who perseveres under trial. For once he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. No one is to say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil. And he himself does not tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is carried away by and enticed by his own lust. Then when lust has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it has run its course, brings forth death. A couple ideas here. Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial. For once he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. What meaning would this have if, in fact, Jesus was not a man? What credentials would that give Christ if he was not a man? Wouldn't it nullify this? In verse 13, it says, no, let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself does not tempt anyone. So God cannot be tempted by evil. And yet we just read several passages that talk to us about the temptation that Jesus undertook and prevailed against. And we can bolster our faith because he did it as a man just like we are. There would be no bolstering if, in fact, Jesus was not a human being. 
there would be no example if, in fact, Jesus wasn't like us. Back in Acts chapter 17, verses 22 through 31. So we looked at Peter's sermon to the Jews shortly after Jesus ascended to heaven. We're going to look at another sermon and see if Paul teaches any different gospel or any different doctrine about the relationship between God and Jesus, or see if it's a consistent message. So Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, so the Athenians, the people that were in Athens, those are the Gentiles. Remember we read there is neither Jew nor Greek. These are the Greeks. What makes them neither Jew nor Greek is the choice of baptism into Christ. Remember that? But Paul is talking to Athenians. He's talking to Gentiles that have not been baptized into Christ. He's teaching them about Christ, and he's teaching them about God. Men of Athens, I see that you are very religious in all respects. For while I was passing through and examining the objects of your worship, I also found an altar with this inscription, To an unknown God. Therefore, what you worship in ignorance... This I proclaim to you, the God who made the world and everything that is in it. Since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made by hands, nor is he served by human hands, as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all people life and breath and all things. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on the face of the earth, having determined their appointed times and the boundaries of their habitation. So the introduction here is about God. He starts out with who God is, what he's done for mankind in his creation, what he's done for the family of man through Adam as being the father of all mankind, what he's done for all of the nations in that he's established their appointed times, he's established the boundaries of their habitation, and what does he leave out here that God is? It's pretty inclusive. The God who made the world and everything that is in it, and that he is the Lord of heaven and earth everything that the eye can see and can't see. That's what God is. That they would seek God, if perhaps they might feel around for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and exist, as even some of your own poets have said, for we also are his descendants. Therefore, since we are the descendants of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by human skill and thought. So this boldness by Paul has always intrigued me. Here he is standing in the middle of a region, and in this case a building, filled with idols to various gods. And he decides to teach them the true God with this idea of an unknown God statue that's right there in that building. And yet he corrects that idea here in the middle of his sermon saying, since we are the descendants of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature that God is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the human skill and thought. And he's tying that back into the idea that God doesn't need anything from us. He doesn't need a temple built from our hands. He doesn't need us to to create objects or images of, of him. An image formed by human skill and thought. 
So having overlooked the time of ignorance, God is now proclaiming to mankind that all people everywhere are to repent. Because he set a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness. Who will judge the world in righteousness? God will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom he has appointed, having furnished proof to all people by raising him from the dead. So Paul's message to the outsiders, the Gentiles, is consistent with Peter's message to the Jews. Jesus is a man. God created everything. God is worthy of our worship. For all things were created by him and by his will. And he is going to, God will judge the world in righteousness through a man that God appointed. In Romans 1, Paul, to, Paul tells us that we are without excuse because of the creation around us. Here he tells the Greeks that man is without an excuse because he raised Jesus from the dead. Back in 1 Corinthians 15, we read the previous three verses at the beginning of this sermon where Paul says that it's imperative to believe that Jesus, the man, was resurrected from dead. Because that's our hope, the hope of resurrection. And then Paul goes on to explain the relationship between God and Jesus. I consider this passage to be one of the foundation passages to understand the difference between who Jesus is and who God is. It's spelled out in order who has the authority over whom. Who is the God and who is the Son of God? And he starts with, but each in his own order, Christ the firstfruits. After, those, after that, those who are Christ's at his coming. Remember, this is the idea of resurrection. It's the same idea that Paul closed with on the sermon on, uh, at Mars Hill, that Jesus was resurrected and that mankind does not have any excuse because of the proof that God laid at Jesus' resurrection. Each after his own order, Christ the firstfruits. After that, those who are Christ's at his coming. Then comes the end, when he hands over the kingdom to our God and Father. When he has abolished all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy that will be abolished is death. Every passage we've read about the resurrection today talks about how it was imperative that a man was going to die and be raised so that he could have power over death. The last enemy that will be abolished is death, for he has put all things in subjection under his feet. And now here is where it gets really clear. Paul's comment here is, but when he says all things are put in subjection, it is clear that this excludes the Father who put all things in subjection to him. How much more simple can it be? Paul is pointing out the fact that God is the authority and that Jesus is his tool. Jesus is the man that he predetermined. Jesus is the method by which his will will be done. And Paul points out very clearly, it is clear that this excludes the Father who put all things in subjection to him. When all things are, are subjected to him, then the Son himself will also be subjected to the one who subjected all things to him, so that God may be all in all. There's no ambiguity. 
There's no nebulous thought. There's no confusion in the message that the apostles sent us in the plan of God. Jesus, the man, the mediator, came in the flesh. He is our brother. He's just like us. Only he was able to fulfill the love your God with all your heart, body, mind, soul, with everything perfectly. And he put his own will, his own desires, his own temptations aside to fulfill God's desires, plans, and in so doing became the victory over death. Peter told us, Peter told us that Jesus is a man. Paul told us that Jesus is a man. John told us that Jesus being in the flesh is imperative to being a believer of the Spirit of God. And those that don't believe that or those that don't teach that Jesus has come in the flesh and what that entails, follow the spirit of Antichrist. And Paul, when he has a perfect time to explain how God and Jesus and that relationship are going to be handled in the future, he explains it that God is not going to be put under Jesus' authority. He's the exception, clearly, because clearly, Jesus is not God. He's the Son. God is God. He's the only God. The first thing he told the Jews was, the Lord your God is one. Let's go ahead and close with a song. The God's Abraham Trades, number 244.
great God in heaven, we come here to learn about your plan of the ages, your plan of salvation, and all of the things that you have promised to us if we just repent and obey your word. We thank you for all of the things that you've given to us, the proof of your existence, the gift of your son sent to this earth, the brethren among us that we can look to and help and support and we lean on when we are weak. We ask that you help us and forgive us when we do fall short. And we ask most of all that when you send your son back to this earth to establish the kingdom, that we find a place in it. In Jesus, we pray. Amen.